sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Our Father, we come before you this after this morning, Lord. We come with humble hearts, Lord. Confessing, Lord, that we are not worthy of your great love. But God, because you are gracious and merciful, God, we come this morning lifting our praise to you, our holy and righteous God. I keep holy power and majesty and glory. So, Lord, let our praises be unto you this morning, Lord. And may we, Lord, give a generous offering of our praise to you because you are worthy. We exalt you, we honor you, we praise you today. Let's continue to lift up our praise to you, God, for you alone are worthy.
of course, uh, is one to acknowledge. You know that our senior pastor, Dr. Brittman, is um, away this morning, and um, we want to lift her and her mother, Brittman, her mother, in prayer this morning. Um, we know that her health has uh, been failing a little bit, so we want to lift them both in prayer this morning. As uh, Minister Thornton will come and offer us, take us to the throne of grace this morning, and we remember again the indigenous people, our leaders, um, the situation with the, the vaccine, there's so many things that we can lift up to the Lord, but we want to make sure that we lift up thanks and praise to God for the good things that he continues to do. When we look back, he was there, we look around, I see he is still working, and we look ahead, he's going to be there for us. So we'll lift, up to, lift everything to the Lord this morning.
in accordance with your good, acceptable, and perfect will. And so we thank you, Lord, that we're not alone this morning, Lord. We have one that intercedes for us, one that gives us strength in our weakness, gives us grace day by day, moment by moment, to handle all of life and sin. And so, Father, we're so grateful and we're so thankful. Father, we thank you for the servant of this house this morning, Dr. Britt Lloyd, we pray for her and for her mother, Britt, yes. and for the household that's there. Yes. And we pray, God, to do that each thing that you have prepared for them, whatever this day brings for them, we know, Lord, that you have them in your care, and we thank you, Lord, for what you do with them, through them, and for them. We thank you, Lord, for the... This week has been a different week and for many. We thank you for the Aboriginal people, some who right here in this place are our relatives in that family. And so we thank you, Lord, that, Lord, we may forget, but you said there's nothing hidden that would not be revealed. And so, Lord, you're revealing all kinds of things in our world today. Some of them good, some not so good. But to remind us, Lord, that you're a God of justice, you're a God of righteousness, and Lord, you want truth to be known, even when it's painful. We thank you, Lord, for arriving this Baptist church, for each one that's come this morning, Lord, and for those that are worshiping with us right now. We thank you, Lord, for what you will do with us, what you've prepared for us. And so, Lord, we thank you for preparing our hearts to receive what you've already prepared for us. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us grace and you prepared good works for us. So help us, Lord, to be graceful in doing the works you've given us to do. Father, we pray for those today who are recovering from illness. We know, Lord, that there are multitudes right now. Maybe somebody in this household has a family member affected by COVID. And yet, Lord, we thank you for the nurses, the doctors, the workers in hospitals, and those our Father, even those who an attempt to try to do something about this, even have come up with a vaccine. So we thank you, Lord, for each thing, because, Lord, none of it goes on without you knowing about it. And so we thank you for your grace, but God, but you, things can be a whole lot worse. But we thank you for your grace. Help those, our Father, who are recovering from COVID. Help those in Alberta, Lord, that have to bring in uh, the army and different parts of the provinces have come and sent medical staff. There's all kinds of things happening. But remember this morning, Father, the people of Haiti are still struggling with the devastating earthquake they had some while ago, and so we thank you for that. Remember the new Canadians who have come here from Afghanistan and other places in our world to try to make a home here, and thank you for this nation being gracious to open the doors of love and compassion to allow them to come in this nation. We thank you for that. Lord, thank you for the young people of the horizons. We pray, God, that as they start the school year, we pray, God, that you open their minds and hearts in a different kind of way as they face this unusual time. But may they know that you are gracious to them. You are kind to them, Lord, and you have given them all things that pertain. We trust the life of God in us. We thank you, Father, this morning for those who may be listening in who have never known the grace of God. We pray, the Lord, this morning that your grace will touch somebody's heart. That somebody who didn't know you this morning, but before the service is over, will be able to say, I believe that Jesus Christ is what I need. And so we thank you for that. Father, there are so many other things that we could add to our list this morning. But we think that we can come to a throne of grace and we can receive mercy and grace to help in the time of need. There are needs, Lord, not even mentioned, there are needs and hearts here this morning that I believe, Lord, and you know they've already spoken to you about it. Thank you for seeing Sister Florence after such a long time, God. Thank you for her kicking her alive and bringing her back if you could see her this morning. Lord, you're a gracious God. You're a gracious God. Nothing escapes your attention. And so, Father, as we continue in this service, we pray that you who are Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Elohim, 
great and mighty God. And thank you, Lord, you've given us to be with you. And we're a part of that wonderful, wonderful family called the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ. To grace that comes to us in Christ. So we thank you, Lord. Minister to us. Minister through us. As we seek by your grace to minister to you. And so, Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise. In Jesus' wonderful name, and let the church say, Amen. Yo! Yeah. 
1 Peter, and if you would stand with me as I read from the word of the Lord. Reading from 1 Peter 2, just two verses, 4 and 5. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A spiritual house. That's where we are this morning, Sister Lawrence, together in a spiritual house, thanking you for your testimony and how we can encourage one another, share and tell of God's goodness. A spiritual house. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, thank you, Lord God, you truly are for your word. A lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And I pray, God, that by your presence, that your Holy Spirit would grant, grant me clarity of thought and speech, that I might divide right in your word. And I ask, God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, in whose name I pray. Amen. Church family, we were made, this can be, this was actually seemingly so appropriate for today. We were made for connection and relationship. So let's consider this morning your kingdom connections. Your kingdom connections. Last week, um, we said that to know and to be known are two of our deepest needs as human beings, right? As relational beings. To know and to be known. And we were reminded that we are fully known and fully loved. And Sister Florence, last week, this week, also omniscient um, God sees us wherever we are. Fully known, he knows when we sit and when we rise, when we go out and when we come in. That's who he is. He knows us. He knows us and he loves us. Revealed in Psalm 139 last week that our, our omniscient or all-knowing God knows us completely. And yet in him we are his wonderful, marvelous, beautiful creation. Remember that? We learned that God the Father has unlimited understanding of all the things, of all things. And that he alone, he alone knows what's best for us. And we, uh, we discover that it's never too late. I meant to share with you um, this one beautiful song that's played on Christian radio. Actually, it's actually called Known. And it goes, I'm fully known and loved by you. You won't let go no matter what I do. And it's not one or the other, fully known or loved. It's hard truth and it's ridiculous grace, the grace of God, to be known. Yes, fully known and love by you, God. Very meaning, meaningful lyrics. You can check it out for yourself. It's beautifully sung. You have to hear it. So today I want to continue with our needs and, and as with regards to being relational beings. We were made for life-giving relationships and fellowship with one another. And I say life-giving, not life-draining. Our coming together in community of shared faith, faith in this place is not by accident. It was designed this way with intention and purpose. As humans, as relational beings, we are better together, and that's the way God intended it. In the passage that has been read, the Apostle Peter speaks of stones, that is, believers, that's us, stones, being fit together into a building. And we know that the chief cornerstone, or the living cornerstone, is Jesus Christ. And he's a living cornerstone because he was resurrected from the dead. He's no longer in the grave. The cornerstone Jesus was rejected by his own people. And at this and, and it is the, the same today. We can re accept or we can reject Jesus Christ. If we accept him, we know that he is the chief cornerstone which brings his whole house into alignment. It's Jesus who brings us together. The house, the building, is not a physical building, but a spiritual building in which our relationships are brought into alignment by Jesus. 
One commentator said, God is taking us living stones and building us into a spiritual house. And not houses. He wants all the stones to fit snugly into that house. He said, you can be a brick, but you can't be the whole house. It takes all the bricks contributing together into the one house. We don't stand alone. We must remember that all of us remember this, that we were all dug out of a pit of sin and cemented together by the grace of God. No one need say that I'm the only one and I'm the only one that's needed. So the ministers, the deacons, the choir director, the choir, contribution to the spiritual house is important. So is the usher's contribution, the trustees, all the officers and the members, everyone who gathers together, the young and our elders. And we are to build up the house with life-giving conversations and actions. We know that Jesus Christ builds and works in us, but we are to build one another up with life-giving conversations and actions. So last week we heard about our relational, relational needs in terms of a vertical relationship. It's a relationship that we have with God. We talked about that. And today we're going to talk about the relationship that we have with God and the relationship that we have with each other. That's our horizontal relationship. We have a vertical relationship and a horizontal relationship. Peter is saying that we should live our lives in reference to Jesus and we will never be put to shame. What we know is that we are not what we should be. We know that. We are not what we used to be though. We're in progress. But neither are what we will be. But because of Christ, we have become priests, is what he's telling us. We can access God through Jesus Christ, and we can become better and present ourselves as living sacrifices, transformed by Christ who lives within us, spending our lives wisely in regards to Christ and his spiritual house. Do we gather together faithfully to offer up our praises to God? Now that we're in this space, we need to remember that we need to gather together faithfully to praise God. It is a spiritual house. Do we encourage and lift one another up? That should be our continuous behavior and action. Fellow believers are our kingdom connections, made possible by Christ. And we may have connections outside, but our kingdom connections, kingdom connections, should be life-giving. We may be bruised on the outside when we go outside, but when we come in here, our experience should be that we are receiving life-giving encouragement. Everyone is facing their own personal giants. Everybody has something going on in their lives. The spiritual house must be a safe and encouraging place where true fellowship and encouragement occur. A great theologian said, the fellowship comes from a word that means shared. So our fellowship means a common participation in something, either by giving what you have to the other person or receiving what he or she has. Give and take, give and take, give and take is the essence of a true fellowship. This little theologian goes on to say that fellowship is two-dimensional and it has to be vertical before it, has to be, before it can be horizontal. We must have that real fellowship with the Father and His Son before we can have real, true fellowship and communion with one another. This is a reference to 1 John 1 and 1, 1 John 1 and 3, where John says, true Christian fellowship has three underlying principles. Our fellowship must be grounded in our testimony of God's Word. We have to be grounded in the Word, because otherwise it's just our thoughts that we're putting out there. We have to be grounded in the Word. Without this underlying strength that we get from God, our real togetherness is impossible. And we act, secondly, it depends on our mutual depending on the unity of other believers. We have to trust that other believers, too, are seeking the Lord. And we have to be renewed daily by whom? The Holy Spirit. If we don't let Holy Spirit guide us, we're still, again, doing things in our own way and with our own thoughts. And that's going to be faulty, isn't it? True fellowship combines interaction and our social uh, actions and our spiritual interaction. And it's only made possible through a living relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We spoke last week about every person must practice the disciplines. Prayer, worship, study, meditation. It sounds like we just say these things, but, but do we do them? And we talked about if we take a mirror and we look in it and we see things that we don't like, we try to correct them. We put a little mascara on, we put a little blush, a little powder and so on to cover them up. Well, we discover, as we read and study the Bible, Bible though, even with our flaws, we are loved unconditionally. But there will be areas that need improvement. Is, is that the term, terminology they use now, like you get a report card? It's like you need some areas may need improvement, or as they say, making progress, SP, you know, making some progress. Or with the report we want to get is satisfactory progress. But we're only going to get that if we're seeking the Lord. Since uh, our vertical fellowship affects our relationship with each other, it is our relationship, I guess what I want to ask us is, is that why our relationships with each other sometimes become so fragile and so fractured and we feel harmed because we are not seeking how God would have us respond to things. From the pulpit to the pew, none of us should be too busy or too distracted to continue to grow in grace. We all struggle, but we should all be growing in grace and knowledge. I love the old scholarly preachers, uh, Spurgeon, who said, if you're struggling with the things of God, to be the Christian that you should be, then you will not be ashamed. This is what the word here is telling us. We will not be ashamed. We may be struggling with some things, but if we're struggling to be a better Christian, we will never be put to shame. If you're struggling and, and you're working through it, it is evidence of your new birth, he says. In the, in the, preceding, the verses preceding the text that I read today, when, when Peter says we're being built into a spiritual house, he is saying to us, we are born again, because when we become spiritual, newborn babies, when we become, um, when we are born again, we become spiritual newborn babies. But if we are healthy, we will want to and yearn to grow. We can't stay in that state so that our relationships are solid, our unity is solid, our fellowship is solid, our commitment to fellowship together is solid. Peter highlights both this relationship that we have with God and the one we have with one another. But he says you must again come first to, as you come to him, the living stone, that's first. Come to Jesus, the, move, the living stone. And then he moves us into the relationship with us that we also are like living stones are being built together into this host, a holy priesthood offering our spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And that is what you did this morning, uh, Sister uh, uh, Wes. You offered, offered your praise unto God for what he has done and how he's working in your life. We come in and we offer our spiritual praises up to God. That's how we are built up in his house. Our fellowship flows out of this collective relationship to God through Christ. Our spiritual houses, all the houses of, that we gather, our sacred gatherings, where the living stones, that's us, are being built up and put together with divine intention and purpose. The Apostle Peter is telling us that we are built up for a reason, too. It's not just for ourselves. We're being built up so that we can go out. All the letters in the New Testament are written, are letters of encouragement to people. And as we read them and we are encouraged, and we are to take that encouragement out to the next person. One of the keys to understanding the whole of fellowship is found in the hands of the Master Jesus himself. The same Peter who gave us our main verse for the day also is one of the primary characters, is one of the most important passages found in the New Testament. And it comes from Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And he said, you know this verse well, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. We are still here. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus says, I will build my church. Yes, us, to call the people from the world and coming together as the church. Christ is building his church with all the people called out of the world and into faith. And Peter was one of the first, if not actually the first person to hear this from Jesus himself. So it's reasonable that we should take Peter's word that Jesus Christ in bringing us together is building something bigger than ourselves. 
Peter knew that Jesus, the master builder, was working on something special, something that would change the world. And we as Christians, as we gather together and we go, there should, we should be making a change in the world. Peter knew the people of God were being built up together into a spiritual house. And not even the very gates of hell, as we said, would overcome him. We are still here despite everything, lifting praises to God, and we should all be motivated by that relationship that we have to God to make, always make this a safe place for everyone to come in. The God who knows us, who loves us, and saved us is also perfectly placing us into the fellowship with, our living, with other living stones. He has not only trusted and sent his son to redeem the world, but he's also put him in charge of the single greatest building project of all time. We think we have the biggest, biggest building project of all time for ourselves, but it's not. And it's not made of bricks and mortar. It doesn't have a street address. We may wonder from time to time, why are we a part of this particular church? It's having so much trouble. Maybe I should go someplace else. You may think sometimes, why do I have the neighbors that I have? You don't like them. And why are we in this particular small group together? You know, some of these people annoy me. Maybe I annoy you. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus is saying, this is exactly where I want you to be. We need to ponder that. We've been going through things for a long time. Maybe the master builder knows he wants you to be just where you are. And maybe, just maybe, it's time to trust the builder and trust where he's placed us in this spiritual house at this spiritual time. Most people are familiar with the story of Doubting Thomas. And if you're not, the gist of the story is that um, Jesus was re reappearing to his disciples after he was resurrected, and somehow Thomas always missed the, you know, when Jesus came around. And so instead of believing the accounts of what other people were telling him, telling him about Jesus, he said, unless I see the nail marks in his hand myself and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands in the side, I will not believe. Well, about a week, a week later, Jesus appears again to the disciples, and this time Thomas is there, and Jesus enters a room that was locked, a room that was locked, and says to Thomas, put your fingers in my, put your fingers here. See my hands? Reach your hand and put it into my side. He says to, to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. We need to stop doubting and believe that he has us here for a purpose. This is for me as well as for you. I've had my moments of doubt too. It's not just for you, it's for me too. He has me just where he wants me to be. I need to stop doubting too. Jesus goes on to say one more thing during that encounter, and this is the statement that I want us to remember today. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. We, didn't, we don't have the luxury of knowing Jesus like the disciples did, and uh, we may never get the chance to sit around the fire. You know, Jesus had a fish fry for the disciples. We won't get to experience any of that. But we have the Bible, and we have Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. By, by faith, we trust that Jesus is building his church. His church. By faith, we are trusting all of us. He is using all of us in the process. For better or for worse, he's using us. Using us to building us up together. That's the plan, and that's the process. We have to trust it. So when God, who created the, this universe, decides to involve us in his master plan, no matter what it looks like to us, I'm saying to me and to us, we need to trust it and be faithful. He knows the plan, and he's included us in the process. And as we learn to trust him, our vertical relationship, we learn to, and as this is, this is what's key for me. As we, I meditated on the scripture, and I realized that as we learn to trust him, that's a vertical relationship. As we learn to trust him, then the horizontal relationship is infected in the fact that we learn to trust each other too. The truth is all of us may have a reason to be suspicious of other people, 
We have been disappointed, we have been hurt, we have been lied to, we have been abused sometimes, and there are a lot of people in the, in the world who would say, uh, I'd rather live on my own than to risk going into the church and being in those relationships. And if we may say that's completely understandable, but the problem with that is we were made for more. We were built to thrive in fellowship with each other. Even though the world tells us that the best way to live is for ourselves, God, go get yours and don't worry about anybody else. Cutting ourselves off from others is not a safe way to live. We, can, we only have to go through some things when we recognize where do we turn. We will turn to the Lord. It's not the Jesus way to live. As I come to a close, there's a popular, popular African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, you know, go alone. If you want to go farther, go together. And the truth is that it's tempting to try and go it alone, but we're not called to go faster. We're called to go further. We want to hurry up, but we're called to go farther, not faster. We're called to go to the very ends of the earth to proclaim and preach, to worship and to pray, to participate in the plan of the Master to build His church wherever that is. I believe that the journey is so much better when we trust God and we trust each other. But it's only in that relationship that we have with the Father and the Son that we, that we will improve, we will enhance and excite and elevate, elevate our relationship with one another. The original word again from fellowship is has to, has a meaning in has its meaning in sh shared. Our fellowship means a common participation in something either by giving what you have to another person or receiving what he or she has. Give and take is the essence of fellowship, and give and take must be the way of fellowship amongst us. If we give and take, if give and take is the essence of our fellowship then I trust that today is a good day for, this, for there to be an opportunity for, for an exchange to take place today, this given day, on this Communion Sunday. As we remember how Jesus went on, how far Jesus went on our behalf, some of us may need to extend forgiveness and some of us may need to receive forgiveness. Some may need to give yourself in service to ministry and some may need to receive in the service and ministry of others. And so, finally, whether you're on the giving or the receiving, my hope is that you will take steps to restore fellowship and relationship with those with whom it has been broken, that you will reconnect or connect with a brother or a sister in Christ and fellowship with the body in truth. My prayer is that you will trust God and trust the community that he has placed us in together. May the Lord give us a vision for fellowship that honors him. May he give us the courage to grow and to thrive in our relationship, our kingdom connections. He has a purpose for us to be here. Let us trust him. Amen. Amen. If you desire to become a part of the spiritual body, to be built up by Jesus himself, then in turn you can build up someone else. I invite you to come to him today. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You've heard me say this before. And if anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. You are invited, that Jesus invites you into his family, his spiritual house that he is building. Won't you join me?
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have a life of life. This is the Lord's table in which all baptized believers are allowed. On the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. Say, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, saying, this is a new covenant in my blood. Pour out for the remission of sins and the redemption of many. Do this in remembrance For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.